I'm Park Howell, and welcome to the Business of Story. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. Hi, and welcome to Business of Story, where we put the bud in earbuds. Hear what I did there? Yeah, sorry about that. Anyways, great to have you plugged into our 82nd episode of Business of Story. You know, we currently have 70 comments and ratings on iTunes, and so I've got a challenge for you. Will you help me get that to 82, you know, in honor of our 82nd episode? Leave your comment, give us a rating, and you'll help share our story with the world, and I cannot tell you how much I'd appreciate that. You know, we have one focus here at Business of Story, and that's story marketing. What I mean by story marketing is that we bring you top story artists from around the world. I'm talking authors, screenwriters, directors, content marketers, sales leaders, visual storytellers, and brand raconteurs who will help you craft and tell compelling business stories that sell. And today, we've got a guy who's going to help you focus your brand story. He's been marketing high tech for more than 30 years, taking companies from bupkis to hundreds of millions of dollars in sales through their focused storytelling. He was most recently the head of international marketing for Infusionsoft, where he helped grow the company from 15 million in annual sales to 100 million by placing a razor sharp edge to their brand story and then helping the Infusionsoft team and its customers live into and prosper from that story. I'm so happy to welcome my friend, Greg Head, to the business of story. You know, you're in the international studios here at Park & Co. in downtown Phoenix, Arizona at Makeshift Productions, I like to call it. So Global headquarters. Global headquarters. It's awesome having you here. Um, you know, Greg and I go back in the Phoenix market for, gosh, 30 years to date ourselves. Yeah. We got to know each other about 20 years ago. Um, I'm I running an ad agency and Greg steeped in technology marketing. So we were working on some clients. Uh, he was within a client I was working on once upon a time, but he went on to great, great things. Most recently at Infusionsoft, where you helped that company grow from what, 15 million to a hundred million over the course of roughly a decade? Well, that's about five years. I was with Infusionsoft as the chief marketing officer from about 2011 to uh, just over a year and a half ago, late 2015. Yeah, and and before that, what were you doing? Well, I've been in the software business for 30 years and a long history and part of three little tiny startup companies that grew up and actually became global uh, name brands. So I've been part of that growth journey, which is kind of unusual. So, you know, I'm a regular guy, from Chicago originally with no, you know, no business being here, but uh, got uh, started early enough that I could be part of these amazing journeys. Well, you act with CRM or worked with CRM companies like Act and SalesLogic? Yeah, those were the first two and Infusionsoft as well. So Act was the first popular contact manager, uh, Windows software for salespeople in the 90s to put their contacts and calendars and all that when they were first learning to type. And we took that from a little tiny company in Dallas to millions of users, uh, you know, several years later. And uh, I helped start a SalesLogix, um, a CRM, customer relationship management software company based here in Phoenix, uh, 20 years ago with the founder of Act and a few others. And we grew that up and went public. And uh, we actually bought Act back from Symantec. We had sold that off and then bought it back. And I ran that for five more years. And then Infusionsoft, which is CRM sales software and marketing software in one system for small businesses and uh, in the modern digital age. Yeah. Well, you grew up in Chicago. So how did you get into marketing and especially technology marketing? Well, just like everybody who got into the technology game, uh, nobody did it in school. It was so new and uh, 
Uh, it wasn't something you could study, and I, I never did anything with computers other than my undergraduate thesis. And a buddy of mine, when I came back to Chicago looking for a real job and feeling funny in a suit and didn't know what I wanted to do, said, hey, work with me at this software retail store, this new thing called Software in a Box, um, called Egghead Software. And I joined Egghead in 1987. Now, wait a minute. Greghead at Egghead. I, yeah, I, I you probably never heard it. that before. Yeah, I, uh, most people don't catch it, but uh, everybody <laughs> watch it. Look at me in my you know, uh, suit with my name tag. Did a double take when they saw Greghead from Egghead. But, you know, Egghead was a friendly face on selling what was a very newfangled thing, this computer software, the disks you put in your computer. And uh, they put a friendly face on it. It was one of the fastest growing companies in America. And it was the beginning of the package software business, which in the beginning, nothing is cool and mainstream and nobody understands it. So only the misfits go there or the passionate fanatics. And uh, I was a misfit and I turned into a passionate fanatic. I love selling and serving and software and creating all this game. And I met a lot of people who made up the first, uh, you know, really big companies. And so was it kind of an industry that then found you? I mean, we all go yeah, through absolutely. that. We get out of school. I, I can definitely say that. I, there was yeah. no intent there. And, you know, there was a few things there that I liked. I'm, um, I, I kind of geeked out on the software. I didn't know I was one of those, but I kind of geeked out on it. Everybody said, how'd you learn all this software? I said, I just learned it. So we played with it. But my dad was an ad guy in Chicago, uh-huh. B2B ad guy in the early days. And so... I didn't want to be him. I didn't know anything about it. But I heard a little bit just coming from him. He would explain what was behind the commercial on TV. I don't think normal families had that with the dinner table discussion. So. Oh, God, my kids have had to live through that for 30 years. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So was was what, Pong, your ent- <clears throat> entryway drug into the technology industry? Or? Yeah, yeah. I, I uh, And I've, I've been, it, interestingly enough, now I just don't play in the technology business, I got to learn the extreme sport of uh, marketing, fast growth companies, uh, going through all the phases of life from a little scrappy thing to a really big thing. And they're all very interesting and very challenging. Yeah. I mean, you've taken so many things just from the, the, the ground floor on up to like major, major enterprises. To this day, after 30 some years in advertising marketing, is there an incident at at Egghead that, that stands out in your mind, a learning lesson that you've kind of used throughout? Well, uh, it's where I started to learn mar- marketing. I mean, I didn't get an MBA and there were no books on this stuff. There was a couple books back then, but you couldn't really learn it in school. And I don't think it's still taught very well in school. That's why we're both here, you know, uh, explaining this. But, you know, I, I, uh, I started at Egghead and I thought, man, I don't know anything about software. I don't know anything about selling. So I kind of panicked and tried to learn everything I could about all these software products and all the details that I just didn't know anything. And I thought everybody knew anything. So for the first six months a year, I just was trying to learn all the details and take home software and play with it. And I think, you know, I don't know. I I was just uh, ambitious or fearful or something like that. And then about a year into it, I realized that in a retail store, a hundred people come in a day and they say, Hey, I got this problem. I'm looking for something like this. And I stood in front of a wall of a thousand package software and I simplified my game. I kind of found out what they were trying to do. And then I'd go over to the wall of software and say, well, there's five of these, but two of these make sense. And this one is for people like this that do these things. And this one is for people like this that do these things. Word Perfect versus Word or Xerox Ventura Publisher versus PageMaker, long form versus short, you know, all those old things, and, you know, just like any product at any time. But I've got to know the simple answer is the right one and the useful one as opposed to the complicated long one. Well, that's what strikes me about you and your world. You are really expert at helping brands understand their one thing. And you've railed on me a couple. Well, railed is a little heavy. It's I suppose after a couple of drinks, then you and I are chatting. You say, "No, Park, how do we get this even more focused?" And it's I think you know in the extreme sports, it's a place that you're a particularly talented athlete of helping brands really fine tune what they what what they stand for. Did that come out of you standing in front of all that software and having to educate a public as to what this is exactly, and then? you know, f- fine tune it down to what your actual needs are? Well, the next step after that is I joined one of these little products uh, that was on the shelf, one of these new things. That was the Act Software. 
uh, at a time where no salespeople I knew, salesperson I knew had a computer and knew how to type. This was sales software. And the first 10 people I ever sold Act to came back and said, this has changed my life. It's amazing. I bought this fancy new computer. It's done, you know. So I said, okay, here's, that's called an opportunity. Um, and then I joined a little company and proceeded to sell it, visit all these egghead stores across the country. And then I became product manager. So I was starting to make the boxes from the front line back. And to make a box with a certain amount of words that you don't get to change, that you have to print, pay for to print an inventory and ship to the warehouse to ship to the store that sits on a shelf, you have to go through a pinhole to refine your message to the best message that it could possibly be for somebody wandering by the shelf. It's just, a you know, that's the game that we were playing. And it didn't take long to say, boy, you can't say everything for everybody. You got to start making choices and make a very simple and strong message. And so there was a forced focus that was required to make a box. So that the choices are in your customer of who is your top customer that you want to sell to. And so you got to make sure that but there's a few choices in there. Yeah. And, you know, uh, what's simple to the outside world, somebody walking by a shelf and saying, oh, I'll take that. That's a very simple choice in our mind. But there's a few elements that are underneath it. It's a lot like the story model. Mm -hmm. We hear stories and they go right to the back of our brain and we think, oh, that's pretty simple. My little egghead story or whatever. But there's a few things that are part of that. So um, the biggest ones that uh, entrepreneurs and marketers and business people can play with are your customer, your target market, your, or maybe your target market and your target customer. So, you know, with ACT, it wasn't for all salespeople, right? The message for all salespeople or anybody who sold, you know, it was kind of – bland and vague when we kind of aimed at those. But when we aimed at the people who were most likely to show up with a computer and want to get off their paper system and ambitious, I want to sell more, that was a subgroup of all salespeople. And when we started aiming our message and saying the things that meant something to them and making features that were relevant to them and tuning in for them, the more we tuned into a smaller group, the higher the signal went and the more people picked the box off the shelf. What do you mean by the higher the signal? Went? Well, most people think that, you know, especially when you're running a business and surviving from day to day, that um, you want to sell to everybody. So you have the biggest chance of a sale when well, that's, uh, you know, that's a misconception. I, maybe that could work in the beginning. But when you want to scale up, you actually um, have to narrow down who you're selling to, narrow down what you say to them. And that game of tuning it is kind of like, uh, you know, what what can create the most response in the that's uh, the signal, if you will. Like, uh, uh, what can you laser in? Because mm -hmm. on the other side of that shelf, the, we, us walking by as consumers in a marketing world, everybody's aiming signals at us, right? And we're only hearing certain things that come through, and the things that get through aren't the ones with the biggest push. They're the ones that respond to what is in our brain. And so there's um, narrowing in on your customer type allows you to really narrow your messages so you can actually get through. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, Park, that's one of the biggest messages or problems these days. Everybody's got enough product and service to sell. And they say, I don't have enough customers, enough traffic, enough followers, enough revenue, enough business. And... Uh, it's really because that signal is not strong enough to get through to the right kind of people usually. Yeah. And when you talk about the big problem is we do live in this land of abundance. There are abundant consultants and abundant software and abundant yeah. products and services and ab abundant hamburger joints and abundant restaurants that we have to f fine tune our message to raise our signal out there. So like you said, we're not hitting people with a howitzer anymore. We yeah. need to be rifle shots to find the people, our tribe, if you will, that really care about what we're doing, that we can connect with them and right. then have the guts to focus on them. And you also get some people in that, uh, sure. that, that come along in the wake of that, don't you? That's right. So uh, in the, since I left Infusionsoft a year ago, I, 
consult with CEOs of emerging growth companies, kind of one to 10 million, that adolescent gangly growth period. And I, I do a lot of coaching uh, and speaking. And, uh, and what I find is that when you start a business, Park, as you're starting your business of story and podcasts and workshops and your business there, and when I'm starting this, when everybody starts a business, it's a little wide to see where things are, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you actually get better traction when you start to narrow down, narrow down who you're talking to, narrow down your messages. But if you flip it to the other side and you look at the big companies already up and running and go back to when they were little, like low companies, you found that they, you, you see that they found a real focus in the very beginning. Every big company, when you say, what did they do when they really started grow, growing? They had an unusual focus, whether it's Walmart or Amazon or uh, Jay Bear or um, any uh, uh, author or whatever. So starting out, you kind of start out in generalist mode, kind of ADD mode, mm -hmm. attention deficit disorder, right? We like, as entrepreneurs, we like to play with a lot of things, but you, know, you spread out to go see where the world is. But the real lesson is that as you grow, and if you look at all successful companies, they kind of sort it out and they find a focus. And the counterintuitive thing in there is you actually have to start saying no along that journey. So it's actually a journey of specialization to help you grow faster by finding the right thing to specialize on. And that's the question. You know, to be one thing, ah, that's the trick. Um, but there's some mechanics to it, just like there are the same mechanics to telling a story. And you had mentioned to me um, once upon a time, not so long ago, about the universe answering that focus. You know, and that, we're not talking about the woo-woo secret thing, but I have found that to be so. So after you told me that, and I was thinking, you know, he's right. I've got to get out of my old mode of, of pulling in business like I used to, that thinking of an ad agency. I turned down five different pieces of business campaign work. I referred them on to other people yeah. that could take care of them. But you know what? Three of those five, I first said, yes, I'm all in. I'm going to send you a proposal. And then I, I knew in my gut it was wrong. And I left that phone call. And then I lost sleep over it. And I remembered our conversation. I thought, no, that's not what I do anymore. So I called him back and said, look, I'm, I'm going to bow out. Thanks for having me. But here's some people that can take care of you. I, so I could focus on my business of story and what my coaching, teaching, and consulting that way. And thanks to you. It did take some guts, but I did have to do that because that's the way I used to make money. That's the way I used to grow. But now in this whole new chapter, that doesn't work for me anymore in what I do. Well, it's a difficult game to sort this out and then make those decisions while you're on the field, running a business, making payroll and doing it. It's hard for only everyone. At, at Park, all the marketing strategy guys like ourselves, we, we're like the barbers that can't cut our own hair. We have to help each other out from an outside in view and a yeah. simplicity, everybody's uh, going through it. And it's part of the journey of going from entrepreneur starting something or startup to something more sustainable. Well, let's talk about that right there. So you went to Infusionsoft, what, about 10 years ago? Yeah, it was, let's say, 2011. So we're not quite there yet, but okay. yeah, yeah. 2011, they were a company that was doing a lot of different things in the CRM area, and they were $15 million in revenue. You know, yeah. pretty nice little company rolling. You helped grow that to $100 million. How much pairing back did you have to do to go in and tell the folks, look, we're, we're in this market, but we really need to focus here. We should probably shut that down. I mean, did you have to do a lot of that to get them there? Well, that's kind of the main magic trick that I think I brought to it. I didn't single-handedly do this, and it wasn't because I was the smartest guy in the room. The founders are uh, Clayton Mask and Scott Martineau are brilliant entrepreneurs and so passionate about helping small businesses grow. Um, but they hadn't learned the lesson of saying no. Um, they were trying to grow as fast as possible. So they said yes to everything. Yes to every kind of customer. Yes to every feature that would go into the software. Yes to every partnership. Yes to every tactic. More is better. Just right? like everybody does, yeah. right? And, yeah. you know, with, uh, with real athletes like this, uh, you know, they're confident and why not do it all? But at 15 million, which is – and relatively sizable for a software company, they stalled. They had venture funding, 130 employees, and they didn't grow for a year and a half. That's really difficult. I mean, that's like, you know, 
uh, pulling your hair out, very uh, everybody kind of losing faith. Are we really going to do this thing and, and all that? And uh, the reality is they had a whole ton of great customers, great employees, but they were trying to be everything for everybody. They wouldn't say no to anybody so they could make their numbers and do. So, so we had to uh, sort out across all the small businesses that they serve. By the way, somebody's called from a big business and they'd say, we'll sell you two, even though it wasn't the right thing. And um, all the messages they had, the 25 things that Infusionsoft could do, they were saying all of them all the time. And so the message wasn't traveling Mm -hmm. and they couldn't even describe what it was. Is it marketing automation? Is it CRM? Is it a sales software? Is it, what is this thing? And they kept changing that. So, um, which is very normal. That's part of the process to go out. And it's a little bit like uh, in selling. I want to sell you today. So what's your problem? Yeah, we do that. Yeah, we're for you. You know, just say yes. And we actually spent about six months saying which are our best customers, which are our worst customers. Maybe we should focus more on the best ones. And we, we got to call it something. What are we going to call it? And it actually is sales and marketing software in one system for small businesses, which then people finally understood why it's different than a simple email tool or the big iron software you get for big companies. And, you know, of 25 things you could say, we got it down to three. You get organized, grow sales and save time and everything hung with that. And, um, and that was there. We didn't change the DNA of the company. We just stopped doing like 75% of the messages. We tried to simple it down and everybody said, no, you can't do that. That's too much. I mean, you're just going to narrow it down. If we don't sell to everybody, we can't grow. But the message wasn't getting out. People even really didn't hear about it. So the more we narrowed it down, here's the magic trick, the more the people we wanted to sell to hurt us. And the more they said, oh, I didn't know you were really for me. I didn't know I did that. I didn't know that was my problem. I didn't know you guys were doing that. And we started to narrow it down. And it's really difficult to connect up to the business model and what your investors want and the big vision. And, you know, we connected it all up pretty tightly. And and then the company started growing. The message was like the light came on to our market. And the company grew 50% for three years in a row. And, you know, that's that's as fast as as fast as you can grow. And we hired another 400 people in the process and and kept on growing. There's other things that happen. The product improved and we got a lot more funding and so forth. But the bigger thing is um, we aimed our guns and, uh, you know, uh, succeeded. You focused your story. Yes. You really got them, instead of being all things to all people, focus it down to what they do best. And you had those three things. So how important was it to get it down to those three things? So not only did your customers understand it, but all these employees that you were bringing on board, you could get them to buy into the story. So they understood what the story was that they were selling or servicing. And uh, at first, when somebody, everybody could do, and the whole company could do the half hour or three hour demo in conversation, the big complicated thing. And, you know, and everybody did a different one. Right. And we said, all right, we're going to simplify. And everybody said, no, we, I can't just say those things. Right. And boy, my tune is a little different than that. And what about that person and that that's going to turn off? I said, oh, just have faith. I've been through this before. Um, and it, we, we got through it pretty quickly. I had to kind of strong arm some people to say, stop saying all that, stop doing all that. And as the marketing leader, I could put it on the website and, you know, I had to own the front door to mm-hmm. the conversation. And the salespeople came around pretty quickly because it started to work. And, you know, here's the magic trick. It's kind of that pause in between when you say it over and over and the confidence build inside the building that you actually do that and people respond to it. And then... There's a consistency, but pretty soon uh, that consistency and repeating the message over and over again outside, um, people started to hear it, right? Mm-hmm. There was no repetition that was happening, like literally none. So so it's as much – you do it f- because you want your story to be heard outside the building better to your right kind of customers, but it creates magic inside the building. And I swear to God, Park, you know, this was – Somebody described Infusionsoft like somebody kicked an anthill. It's a very energetic and everybody going different directions kind of thing. And it still is like a very energetic and passionate company. Uh, But after six months, 
the in, in infinite debates about what do we say and who are we for and what do we do, what are the, you know, went away. So new employees would start and they'd say, here's exactly who we're selling to. Here's what we say. Here's what they want. You know, there's three types. We do these things. It just, I remember I said, oh, thanks. Right. Before you had to get be with the company a year to be able to get that get tribal on. knowledge. Yeah. Right. And yeah. then we went to like first day on the phone. I sold one. Yeah. You know, isn't it interesting how that <clears throat> boils down to the beginning of this conversation is you had said, really understand your audience, that customer, yeah. that number one customer, even to the point that it gives you flop sweats because you're afraid you're going to be losing out on all this other business. So yeah. that's number one. Then number two, understanding what it is they need. And so what stories that you are going to yeah. share with them to get them to buy into it. Then, of course, you've got to deliver on those promises yes. you make in the story. So the product's got to do what it says it's got to do. But then you have to have that simplicity of story for you your employees as well so that they can live into that story and prosper from it by sharing it as simply and replicably, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> repeatable yeah. Yeah, as possible. Yeah. Well, that's the key to scaling any business. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the fanatic founder can tell their magic story all day long. But when you hire your 21st salesperson, and, you know, they start on Tuesday and you're not going to see them. They they have to be able to get up and running. Yeah. You, it's a simpler story has to be there for them that has to be true. So that, it's part of the magic trick. As marketers, we think, how do we tell a, a better story to create more impact in the world? But the other half of this focus magic trick is that it creates better execution. Mm -hmm. When a software developer sits down and says, I'm going to make this feature – it makes it a lot easier to make a great feature when you know exactly who you're building it for. Or to and, say no. And who you're not building yeah. it for. Like, um, I, I deal with a lot of very smart, very technical technology founders. And the metaphor of uh, a restaurant, you know, they're starting to hear it. A chef can make any kind of food. Like if you have any friends parked that are chefs, I, I know a few in, in just this neighborhood, and they make any kind of food. Today I made ice cream. The next day I made Thai food. Like for the neighbors, it always just appears. But when you want to make a restaurant, it's one kind of food, like pretty narrowly defined for one kind of customer. You go into every restaurant, and they all look about the same crowd, and you make it every day. So that's what a business is, a scalable business. And by the ones, ones, the restaurants that scale nationally from little local concepts have even more focus. Mm -hmm. And so if you keep going down that, the ones that take off, if you want to follow any restaurant that has a line in front or a software company that got funding or whatever, you can see they went from many things to many people to finding what they can focus on. And when they're growing, they're just – just hamburgers, just small businesses yeah. was the epiphany in Infusionsoft. Someone um, told me, and maybe it was you, I don't know, that who is the top grossing hamburger joint franchise in America? Yeah, it's the, you know, the, the top same store sales, right? It's actually In-N-Out Burger, which if you go to In-N-Out Burger out west coast here, it's just burgers. That's all they do. Eyes and Coke, which is part of what a burger is these days. Yeah. And if you go to McDonald's, burger... I can't even imagine if it's 10% of what they sell, coffee and salads and uh, ice creams and uh, breakfast, you know, all that kind of stuff. They, in and out Burger does more same-store sales than a McDonald's. Isn't that interesting? Right. Because they have that focus. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, all big companies are kind of many things to many people now. Amazon, mm -hmm. anything you can buy with one click, and rockets and uh, technology you know, infrastructure, they're changing the way the software business is run. But in the beginning, what was just books online, the world's largest bookstore with a million books. And you, you, you can do that to any big company that is confused and, you know, yeah. multi-product and all that. In the beginning, they were just well, since you've left Infusionsoft, and I'd like to talk about this next endeavor right after our break for our sponsor's stories, you have been out talking to CEOs around the world. 
and you've been getting some lot of interesting insights that I think is going to go into a book eventually of yours. I'd love to talk to you about that effort and what are you he- what are you hearing? What are some of the themes you are hearing from these CEOs that our listeners can take away about helping really refine and define their story? So let's cover that, Greg, right after these messages. Welcome to a new segment here on Business of Story I call the Story Marketer of the Week. It's where I'm going to highlight the brands that are doing a really good job with their storytelling. So for instance, today I want to give a big shout out to the Sock Club as my very first Story Marketer of the Week. You see, my son Parker gave me a subscription to Sock Club for Christmas. So now every month I get a custom pair of socks. But more than that, I get a story with every pair. My February socks that I'm wearing right now are called the Amelia for Amelia Earhart. Here's how the story goes down. The package arrives in a lightweight brown cardboard envelope that begins the sock club experience. Inside, your socks are wrapped in brown paper secured with a hot wax red stamp. You know, the kind you would have found in closing a 17th century letter, for instance. Well, accompanying the socks is the story behind each design's inspiration. Like for this pair, the sock club tells us that the Amelia, with its wing-shaped repeating pattern, is named for Amelia Earhart, who defied the odds and overcame great obstacles. Now, their story is much longer than that, so you'll have to get your own pair to hear the rest of the story. But you see what I love about this is the Sock Club has used their clever story marketing to enhance the value of their product by infusing it with meaning through the stories they share. By turning a commodity into a cultural experience, literally from the ground up in their case, they've earned my Story Marketer of the Week shout out. Now, if you'd like to hear from the mastermind behind this story marketing marvel, tune in in a couple of weeks when we'll have Melissa Heisman, creative brand manager at Sock Club, with us right here on Business of Story. If you'd like to learn more about Sock Club right now and read the story that came with my January pair of socks, check out my post on businessofstory.com. People come to me and say, Park, we've got a great business model. We're making money and we're growing fast, but we don't have our brand story straight. And then I ask them what their biggest pain points are. And they tell me, well, our growth is requiring us to add a lot of new people. And now we don't have everyone pulling in the same direction. Plus, other companies have taken notice of our success, and we don't have a brand story that differentiates us from them. You know, they also tell me that when their bankers or potential investors show up and ask them about their brand story, they don't have a clear narrative to share with them. In fact, that's often the most embarrassing part of not having their brand story straight. So if this sounds like you, you can start getting your story straight right now by downloading your own Business of Story How-To Guide. I take you through the 10 proven steps of the story cycle system, complete with a short explainer videos. So I'm there with you every step of the way. This guide will help you define the fundamentals of your authentic story. It'll help you clarify your number one position in your market to differentiate you from your competition, declare your unique value proposition, map your customer journey, and define your brand purpose, among other things. The Story Cycle System has helped companies like yours grow by as much as 400%. So put the Business of Story workbook to work for you and create epic growth for your enterprise and your people by crafting a story they can all live into and prosper from. Story on. Welcome back to Business of Story and our guest today, Greg Head. Greg, what is your official title? Well, I call myself a uh, strategic growth advisor for CEOs. Strategic growth advisor. And are you focusing just on the startup community? I know you and I are both uh, presenting at Phoenix Startup Week next week, but are, are, who, are you fo- who is your focused audience? You there we go. We're just, right? Uh-huh. And uh, people out there in the audience are saying, is this guy for me? And when uh, I'm just for a certain group, uh, there are a lot of startups just getting started and little small businesses and, you know, just things getting started and they're trying to find their way uh, and get up and running. And when I speak and I write, uh, those messages get uh, there. But really, I serve as a consultant and coach and advisor to the CEOs of emerging growth companies. And it's typically kind of $1 million to $10 million 
ambitious growth companies, which isn't everybody. Not everybody's trying to take over the world and, you know, double their sales and solve big problems in the world. So, but that's, you know, so different than the small businesses and the just starting and different than the big businesses that already are up and running and have a flywheel going and VPs of everything. Those are just very different too, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's for the growers Mm -hmm. and their early stage, which is kind of crazy. And you as an ad guy, you remember all those crazy guys that say someday, including Clayton Scott around town here when they were 10 people and Mm -hmm. wanted to take over the world, um, sounded crazy. And you try to help them do something and they're running around in circles and it's really hard to help them. So I like the crazy ones and uh, I help them. Park, I'm part marketer and I'm part entrepreneur CEO. Is it fair to say operations somewhat too? Because it seems like you really have your your head and hands in that as well, bringing it all together. Well, I'm an operator Mm -hmm. and marketing is a lot of operations and running a business is a lot of operations. I mean, we, we talk about some of these higher concept and strategy stuff and these big questions, but the game is played and won every day doing stuff and executing and operating. And so I come from 30 years of being inside the machine. So I know the hard realities. <laughs> yeah. I know what making payroll is like. You know what hurts. Know when a marketer comes to me and says <laughs> we should focus and I say, oh, man, that's going to hurt. Yeah. I, I, I got to make my quarterly numbers. And uh, and I've been on both, all sides of it. Yeah. So that's part of the journey. It, this isn't a paper exercise. It's a creation exercise, creating businesses and products and ideas and momentum and teams. It's uh, It's all very – uh, fun. So you and I sort of serve, well, not sort of, you and I service uh, the same market out there in that um, mine, of course, is about brand story, strategy development, the communications um, behind all that. But yeah. it is that emerging entrepreneur too. It's the same thing that really drove the business at Park & Co. And I love working with those folks. And here's why. You Like you said, they are typically, the ones I work with are typically between one, one to six to seven million, mm-hmm. and they're ready to take that next step. They always have a solid business model. What they're selling is working, and they're growing very quickly. Um, the founder typically shows up, right. sometimes uh, with his or her wife or husband, and maybe a, a operations person or a marketing person. And they're like, oh, my God, you got to help us. And this is what they always say. I say, how can I help you? And they, they will say, we have our business model down. We're making lots of money and we're expanding, but we do not have our brand story straight. We, uh, we, it, and I said, well, what does that look like? I mean, tell me about that. And they say, well, number one, look, at, we're doing so well. We've been in this business five to 10 years. The competition is starting to take note. So I've all of a sudden got more people competing for my uh, business out there and I don't have a brand differentiator. Number two, I'm expanding, just like you said, with Infusionsoft. You know, we're adding 5, 10, 15, 20, 40 people a month, and I can't get them pulling all in the same direction. So I need that focused brand story so I know what to tell them. Again, I think what you did at Infusionsoft when you took 100 different story elements and boiled it down to the three primary pillars. Right. And then the third one I find so interesting is – The frustration and embarrassment, and they will say this, I'm embarrassed when my banker comes and I need to get a loan and they need me to tell them the story and I don't know what it is, or I've got venture capitalists showing up. And we were embarrassed last week trying to explain who we are and what we do. We don't have our story straight. So that is that emerging market that I love working with, and it almost doesn't matter industry because they have that same uh, pain point. Got a business model. We don't have our brand story straight. Can you help us? Yeah, I see that a lot because uh, if you've got an up and running business, it's there's stuff in the story that's working. Yeah, I mean it's not just I'm going to strong I'm going to find people and strong arm them, right? No, mm-hmm. there's 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 the story is kind of getting heard out there, and there's customers and happy ones, and they're paying you, and the product works enough. And uh, what I find is, uh, and there's a lot of great entrepreneurs and they're great athletes. They're very smart, work very hard and figure out all these new things they have to figure out every day. Uh, but what I describe it as, they don't realize the sport they need to play is changing. Mm-hmm. They're great athletes. And to start a business, you need to learn, let's say, tennis, right? How to hit the racket and backhand and go, you know, the five moves there of doing that. And when you go from three to 10 million, it's still a sport, but it looks a lot more like baseball. Mm-hmm. The moves are different. 
And if you show up with a tennis racket to that sport, you're going to kind of get screwed and you probably should know some of the plays. So the sport of growing companies, which in the software business, that's kind of the goal. You start small, you want to be big. Um, the sport changes along the way. And so uh, gr- entrepreneurs recognize that something has changed, but they're not sure what has changed. I thought what I did last year times two would work, but something else is going on. So we can't, you and I help diagnose the, you know, and reset the foundational strategic uh, um, components so they can help grow into the next level. And it's usually a lot of uh, focus and there's therapy involved, right? To get through the sleepless nights. And it's a complicated game. I love dealing with the puzzle the business model and what the vision is of the company and what investors want and what the competition is and how the world's changing and how they're tactically getting customers and who are their customers. It's, it's just a wonderful puzzle and uh, um, it can be a pretty intense game, but that's, that's where it is. The insights that come from playing that intense game can really help create big companies and change the world. And when you, fine tune the playbook and simplify it. Like again, you did it in Fusionsoft and get that very focused story. I imagine that does help you in the next year and the next year and the next year when people are trying to innovate and do things, but it gives you sort of a score pad about interesting innovation, not right for our customer. Let's yeah. not do that. Oh, this one over here has some promise because it plays into it. It, it honors or supports the story that we are working out there to, to grow. Yeah, you actually have to go from playing the sport of yes to survive mm-hmm. and see and play long enough to the sport of no. Like the successful growers, you say, can you add this feature? And they say, no. Or you go to a restaurant, your favorite restaurant, the best barbecue in Phoenix, Little Miss Barbecue with the line, a two-hour line every day. And you say, hey, can you make some spaghetti? And they say, no, right? But, you know, on the whiteboard, it's good about anything. So so generally speaking, you could see how mature a company is getting across that journey by how comfortable they are saying no, right? A big company, big companies ask me all the time, can you be our chief marketing officer and for this venture funded company or can you help us? We've got VPs of everything. We've got a focus problem. Everybody's got it. And I say, no, I help the CEOs of the growers and uh, I get to work with their business. So here's part of my magic trick. I'm not just crafting the message. I'm helping them tune the business, move the business pieces around. I know that's made up. I've made those things up. I know you're making it up. Let's move the business. Nothing is in stone. And if I can help them adjust the business so there's more focus, so the marketing can work and execution can work better inside the business, right, by focusing on what works and saying no to the stuff that isn't Mm -hmm. paying off, um, that's just – that's the move. That's the turn. And um, if you stay ADD saying yes to everybody, your company will stall 100% of the time. So how many CEOs have you spoken with in, in the book that you're pulling together in the last year or so? Well, it's uh, it's probably almost 300 uh, CEOs. And CEOs of what kinds of companies? Are these the emerging companies you yeah, talked about earlier? a lot earlier? of them are software companies that mm-hmm. are, have ambition and, you know, funding and I want to grow and they're in a growth game. But there's a lot of other uh, ambitious small business owners and services companies and the rest. Interestingly, Park, the software businesses of old – uh, and the regular businesses of old, and really till about 10 years ago, they were just two different games. Mm-hmm. And you couldn't translate back and forth very well. Somebody was trying to make a profit over here in the regular business and software businesses didn't make profits. And it was, you know, it was just a very different game. I find that the software startups that have software and technology and some services to do that look a lot like growing businesses. Service, they have technology and services and right some real focus. So they're actually kind of blending yeah. together in some ways. What's the one question you ask all of them? Well, I start with, do you have, you know, do you have the marketing problem? How's your marketing working? And of course, everybody's got the marketing problem. So that's the front door that I start with. I have fun with that. And it goes to the center of the universe. Because mm-hmm. um, I can ask people, gosh, could you grow better if you added another feature to your software, another plate to your, another dish to your restaurant or if you started tweeting more, something like that, and you know, they say uh, not not really, uh, but 
I do need more customers, more, more of the better customers. I wish they'd stay longer. I need revenues in business. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really a challenge. I spent time with, uh, there was about four or 5,000 software founders in San Francisco last week at the Saster Conference, Software as a Service Conference for Modern Software Leaders. And everybody's struggling with it. It's easy to make software these days. It's hard to find and keep customers and make a sustainable growing business out of that. What's the most surprising finding you've heard through these hundreds of CEOs? Is there something that really caught you by surprise that you're hearing over and over again? Well, I don't know that it's a surprise, but I do hear this over and over again. Every entrepreneur, every CEO, every growth uh, founder is uh, really struggling to run the business. I mean, it's, it, you would say that it's easier than ever to start a business. It's really challenging to grow one. They're in the whack-a-mole game every day. Uh, people, hiring people, getting a leadership team, funding, customers, pricing, building and delivering your product or service, finding more customers, getting the sales model. It's, you, you know, uh, operational stuff like financials and HR. Everything is... Uh, is complicated and these pieces all have to work together, which is another reason why a simple focus is required to scale because as businesses grow, businesses are very complicated. Global businesses are very complicated, all that. So if you have a complicated story that the founder made up and it changes daily, right? You can't really make a scaled global operation out of it or something like that. You can imagine. Now, you're going to take all this wonderful IP yes. and create a book. Yeah. So I'm going to put you on, you know, your awesome. deadline right here. Yeah, that's right. When do we get to read it? When's it coming out? Well, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a little like Jerry Seinfeld. I got to go out every day and tell the story and see if it still works yeah. and, and, uh, and collect more stories. So I'm working on it and um, I'm writing it this year and it'll be available next year. And it isn't about everything for everybody. Good. It's for the CEOs, not the of emerging of, companies, emerging companies yeah. who are in the firefight and on the field playing this game and trying to change the world. And it is about the strategic, you know, marketing challenge. And we say focus and, or build a brand or what's your position. These are very amorphous words and we didn't learn about them in college and everybody's got a different description of them. I've got a simple framework for CEOs to find their focus levers, and in the midst of growing their company every day, find a way to turn them on. And it's very difficult, And uh, but that's there's no other way to do it. What brands out there are you seeing um, do you think are doing a pretty good job in your line of work, be they technology, software, whatever, that you see they are having that growth and they've got a really good focus story? Well, I could tell you an example of a, a local company here in Phoenix that just started – uh, just over a year ago and is uh, taking off. They're going to be one of the big companies uh, in uh, Phoenix. And they're so, still so new that uh, it looks a little strange and you wonder if it's true, but I'll, I'm seeing the future here. And I'll tell you, it's a company called OfferPad. And OfferPad, uh, you go to their website and you want to sell your house and move to a different house. When you start that game, you have to... Um, Get a real estate agent and then fix up your house and go through the nine nightmares. We're in the selling. middle of that right I'm now. Sorry to hear that part. Yes. And I haven't met anybody who likes any of that. But if you went to OfferPad, you could put in the address of your house and you could get an offer on your house in 24 hours. Uh, and it's a competitive offer, like what you would get when you went through nine months of. Is this up and running already? It is up and running. Um, and it's uh, it's really a uh, they're a national home buyer, but in a whole modern way. The whole you know what what Uber did to transportation, they just did it. They didn't do anything the way the taxi business mm -hmm. does it. And these guys are doing it to selling your home, not in the way that anybody in real estate does it. Offerpad.com. Offerpad.com. Yeah. And it's a Phoenix company. They're hiring twenty people a week. They just raised two hundred sixty million dollars. Their first year was a rocket ride. Everybody is relieved not to have to go through the process to get a reasonable price for their home, like the same net price. And they're not. I'm going to literally go on this yes. this afternoon, yeah. and I would imagine they're going to lowball me because it's an no. investor group. So that's that's then they're going to spin it. No, no, it isn't. So a that's the anti-story. My mind immediately says to offer Pat. How do you counter that? Uh, 
Well, you prove it. Um, and so part of the challenge is everybody has a misconception about what their home is actually worth mm -hmm. and what the fees are. The real estate industry has told us, you know, here's what your house is worth. Uh, but, you know, it's really worth net of fees, you know, six, nine percent with after title and insurance and fix up and all the rigmarole there. So, um, no, so now they they're clear about what they do and they have a focus. Uh, and, you know, there's some tightening that's happening over there. But now those narratives that live in your mind mm -hmm. about, I guess they're going to lowball me or mm -hmm. here's why they're not lowballing. Those are narratives in a story model that are going to spread and it's starting to spread. So I'll just tell you the magic trick. This is the future before it arrives of these crazy startups. Um, you know, it's actually a competitive price. They don't have to pay 26 people in the real estate industry to sell a home. They just buy it and sell it, right? How about we just did all that for you? Take all the pain away. I can't wait to check it out. Yeah. All right, let's wrap the show with a couple of insights for our listeners. I mean, you've been giving us a ton of them. Greg, so you are speaking at, at, at Phoenix Startup Week next week. If you're talking to that audience or, or the crowd here, what? And, and, and we've got folks that are startup, and you know, we got a lot of solopreneurs listen to this show. What would you tell? What are the couple, three things that they could do right away to help them you know, grow what they got going or manage what they got going? Well, uh, the first rule of the game is to know what game you're playing. And so, uh, and play the appropriate game. So the first question I ask people is, you know, what stage of your business are you? Are you trying to find your focus and your little ADD going to spend, you know, check a lot of things out and sort things out? Or are you trying to scale up? You've, you've found it. And um, don't confuse the two. Stop being ADD. You got to get OCD, obsessive compulsive. I mean, you know, have you been to McDonald's? These people are obsessive compulsive about sesame seeds on but I mean, every detail is worked out. And that's what a scalable business is. So play the right game at the right time. Um, and the second thing I would say is nine out of 10 CEOs that I've met are not focused enough. I mean, it's just kind of the simple answer. They say, I got this problem. And before I, you know, I could probably just say, well, you have a focus problem when I go through the exercise. So you know, find a way to narrow your focus to increase the power of your business and your execution. Everybody thinks they're more focused than they should be. But if you step back and you're on the outside world, I'm not quite hearing it. And if you step in and look at their execution, it isn't quite as great as you thought. And so focus is the answer to improve how the world hears you and improve and to make something great. Mm -hmm. You got to make something great today, these days. Sorry. We just don't want mediocre. We spend all our lives avoiding mediocre. We want the perfect thing for us now. Yeah. And because we live in that land of abundance. So we have a lot of different selections. The more focus we get, as you said earlier, the higher our signal is around our story so right. that we're resonating with folks. Right. And we're not competing in the local neighborhood anymore. Like when you're the only store on Main Street, you can be a general store and sell everything to everybody, licorice to the kids and I don't know, you know, farm equipment out back or whatever. But in today's Internet age and like the retail age and the services age, specialists are eating generalists mm -hmm. all day long. So what's your focus is really the question. And how can you be how could you grow faster by being just for somebody, just this. I like a question that. to keep asking. It's hard. I yeah. get it. And uh, but that's that's re CEOs are responsible for that. You can't delegate that to the marketing department. Yeah. Well, Greg, thank you so much for being here with us today on Business of Story. Really fascinating. Look, you've done so many uh, amazing things with some s small companies that you took large that uh, you have a lot to share with folks out there. So I appreciate you being here. Pleasure to be here, Park. Yeah, thank you all for listening to this edition of Business of Story. Um, just always love having you all around. You know, if you are looking to really refine your story, again, whether you're a solopreneur or an emerging growth company, if you're listening, it means you're trying to get your brand story straight. So um, I've got plenty of tools for you over at businessofstory.com. I've got a workbook that you can download and use, a DIY workbook that can help you get your story straight. And then I'm here for you, too, in speaking engagements, consults, workshops, whatever you need to help you make it happen on your end. So uh, visit me over at businessofstory.com. And of course, join us next week when we will have another amazing story artist like Greg here at Business of Story. And until then, have a wonderful life.